week on the show, we have Australian filmmaker Chris Robert Regal. He is the director and writer of the new movie, Expectations. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of understanding why experiencing failures are equally as important as the wins. The reality is, if you're not experiencing failure on your journey to success, then this simply means you aren't trying hard enough. When you are, failure simply becomes evidence that you're trying to make major moves and aiming big. Let's now look at failure on a deeper level. Think about it. If life never had any challenges and you achieved everything you wanted without any failures, would your goals even be exciting to achieve? Would you ever learn anything new or have the hunger to succeed if success was guaranteed? The reality is the challenge and journey to get to your destination is what makes life exciting. Just the possibility that something is possible is enough of a factor to drive people to achieve their goals because possibility is where the journey to any great achievement begins. The next time you find yourself dwelling in your failures, remind yourself that failure is simply making space for more exciting opportunities to come. As Sylvester Stallone quotes in the movie Rocky, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break. Very nice. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about your film, Expectations. You wrote it and you directed it. I know it's based on the literary classic, Great Expectations. So tell us about the film. Well, you know, it's funny. We had a little slogan before we began. Um, you know, I, I had some amazing producers on this film. You know, Andrew Panay, Jared Arsino over at Panay Films, and you know, my producing partner Clay Bacorn, uh at Rainmaker and Dave Hanson. And we, we had a really entertaining conversation in the early stages of this. Uh, I always a big believer in this idea of having producers who just love the material. They give you great notes. They're never shy of their opinions, and uh, this one is no exception. And so, you know. We kind of had a mission in the beginning to create a great expectation that is not our grandparents' great expectations. Yeah. So bringing it a little bit different, doing it a little bit differently, and um, you know, hopefully we're able to, to achieve that. But one of the things I will say is that there's an interesting gap in the timeline. You know, we, when we look at when Dickens first created these characters, uh, you know, it's almost 160 years ago. And there's just so many things that, you know, when we look at the medical advancements we've had since then, and the technological aspects and just the socio-political development of the world and globalization and economics, they're beyond all of these changes. There's so many unique things that are similar or, or are the same. And, and sort of what does that say about our society? Great expectations, you know, between Pip wanting a benefactor in the source material. It, we get to follow that into the comedic twist that is expectations. Wardrobe provided by Le Chateau. Next up on the show, we have Australian filmmaker Chris Robert Regal. He is known for his involvement in films like Dallas Buyers Club, Stowaway, and his most recent film, Expectations, which he wrote and directed based on the literary classic Great Expectations. The film stars Samuel Arnold, Rita Lipa, and Walking Dead star Callan McAuliffe. Chris, thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Dariel. And also, thank you for uh, just having a great conversation. It's always good to be able to talk to like minds and, and, and artistic people. Absolutely. I'm really excited to talk to you. We have a lot to talk about. But before we get into everything, let's talk about before we get into your involvement with the Dallas Buyers Club and your new movie, Expectations, let's talk about how it all began and your passion for film. What intrigued you about filmmaking? You know, I, I wish I had one of those stories that, that, you know, like someone that knew artistically what they wanted to do when they were a teenager. I, I wish I had that. I did not. Um, I, it kind of has come to me a little bit later in life. And I think that that's one of those things that we, we, we are all on our own creative journey, no matter what field we choose. And, and you know, for me, coming to filmmaking, um, you know, it, it, it was a natural evolution because I, I as, a, as a kid, I, I wanted to play sports. I wanted to be outdoors, um, you know, and I grew up internationally between a bunch of different places. And as a result of it, um, you know, it, it made moving around 
you know, I, I guess you could say a challenge uh, for, for finding myself and my adolescence and, and figuring out my own identity. Uh, I had a lot of influences. And one of the things that I will say about that is that uh, nothing was more influential for me than to be in different places like Australia or New Zealand or North America or Latin, you know, parts of North America like Latin America and see different films and television shows that express different cultural values and, and, and different people's perspectives and experiences. And I'd say that for me, as a, as a person who was traveling and, and, and you know, um, was developing as a young man, uh, all of those influences, uh, you know, are, are a part of me. And I think that that was really the first time I, I became interested in, in, in films and, and the filmmaking aspect of things and how these stories were brought to us. Um, but it wasn't until I, I got a little bit older and, you know, I, I had played baseball and I had gotten injured and I began to realize that for me, coming back from things like that, coming back from injuries or setbacks in life, we all kind of tell ourselves stories to motivate or, you know, to, to give ourselves an example of something that could work out to kind of increase hope or, or poise in our lives. And that was really when I began to realize that um, I, I enjoyed stories and, and that I had stories I wanted to tell, not really even my own, but just all the experiences I've accumulated growing up across, you know, on my travels. And um, I'd say my way into filmmaking was beginning to realize how important storytelling was, was in my life. And, um, and, you know, it kind of set me on a path after I graduated from university uh, that I'm still traveling to today. Yeah, I completely agree with that, too, because for me, I became a journalist because I, I love storytelling. I would tell like, stories as a kid to my friends, and I just was always intrigued with that. So I love that you also had a passion for sto storytelling, and look where it's uh, taking you. And I want to talk a little bit about, about I know that you we're supposed to be a baseball player. That was your original goal, but then you did get injured. I know you touched base on that. So let's talk about that and how it kind of changed your trajectory in your career. Absolutely. I um, you know, I wish I wish I was good enough to have at some point made it to another level. Um, you know, there were there were people I, I had the privilege of playing with and are still very much in my life. Uh, who, who made it, you know, to the to, to the major leagues, and uh, I'm very, very, very far off on that. So I always appreciate when anybody thinks I might have been decent enough to make that <laughs> jump. But what I will say is that you know there are so many things in life that, that crop up in ways that we don't expect it, that we don't hope it. Uh, they really seem unfair, you know, and and, and it's not right. Um, but there's sometimes there's just things that we can't do anything about it. It, it, it just is life and it's the way it's going to be. And, you know, for me, I, I've always looked at things and, and setbacks and, you know, the idea of getting injured or maybe the idea that something didn't work out the way we planned it to be. Um, this idea of plans, I've always looked at it as more, what's more important about it is, is how we respond when we have that setback. Um, how we respond, how we get back up, or how we reorient ourselves. Uh, that's a really, really impressive um, and inspirational aspect to storytelling because I think almost every story tell, storyteller that we've ever encountered has a bit of that about people who encounter adversity. And, you know, for me, um, you know, I've encountered, you know, probably as much adversity in my life as really anybody else. We all do. But the thing that's been really healthy and beneficial for me in my journey has been, you know, surrounding myself with really good people that have, you know, been able to communicate with me, you know, teach me, to point me even in the right direction. And sometimes it's as simple as listening to me or, or vice versa, you know, you listening to another person to garner their experiences, to make them feel heard and help them on, on, on their way. Um, you know, for me, the setbacks I've had in my life um, have, have helped reorient me onto the path I am today. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I couldn't be more thankful and happier for how it's all turned out. Of course, at the moment, sometimes you don't really feel that way. It's not really a comfort, but you can't see things in the full picture until you're really at the end of the road. And so, um, so yeah, so I'd say that that's sort of one of the reasons why everything that, I ha that happened to me at that period of time in my life has helped me on my journey to, to being a filmmaker. Yeah, and speaking about adversity, I know that you grew up an orphan. So, how do you think that shaped you into who you are today? It's 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 actually a really cool lead into expectations. The the upcoming film I just directed because you know uh, Charles Dickens. You know, if anyone's read Charles Dickens, so they know he has a penchant for creating characters that are orphans. Um, you know, I, I am one of those people who you know, whether good or ill, it's it's just was one of the things in my life that I. You know that, that sort of happened to me at a young age and uh, i'm really thankful for the way everything in my life has turned out 
But one of the things that I will say that, you know, was sort of connective tissue for me as a storyteller um, and, and, and aligning myself a bit with Dickens and a bit with the characters in Dickens uh, was this idea of identity. Um, it's this idea of, of who are we as people at our core, as artists, you know, if we're all artists, how do we communicate our art? A lot of times people talk about writing, painting, sculpting, the things we know. When you're forming your own identity and you maybe don't have someone uh, or, 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 or an idea or a familial unit to sort of help fill in some of those gaps, what do you do along the way? Um, you know, in the film, um, you know, we sort of follow a, a series of hilarity and comedic moments uh, along with our characters to, so that they can kind of come to this answer of who and what they are and what they stand for. Um, for me, it wasn't something so lovely condensed into a weekend. <laughs> it was kind of a journey uh, to, to figure that out in my teens. But one of the things that really helped me, obviously, was spending time abroad in different places, you know, getting to be in places like Vancouver and Toronto, uh, getting to see, you know, Quebec and Montreal for the first time, um, being in Mexico City, going to being in Australia, New Zealand and Auckland in particular, and just beginning to get an idea of how global the world is, how many different ways there are to view problems and, and lifestyles and just, just different things that, you know, that there's so many ways to look at so much. And that began to make me feel really connected in the sense that there's so many things I have to answer about myself, much like the characters in Charles Dickens and in this film, um, but there are so many people that, that have so many different ways to, to answer these questions, to, to figure out these conundrums, and to, to identify themselves with. And, and so, you know, I always say sometimes you have to take uh, something that seems like a negative and turn it into a positive. And, you know, for me, you'll, you'll see it a lot in the work and, and, and hopefully have a few laughs about it along the way too. Very nice. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But before we get into that, I want to talk about your company, Rainmaker Films. Uh, I know that you're a co-founder on that. Um, and it has amazing credits like the Dallas Buyers Club, uh, Ceiling Cars, co-produced co by Mark Wahlberg. So tell us about some of the collaborations uh, with your company. You know, I'm, I'm also really fortunate. And I mentioned earlier about the ability and, 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 and I think the good fortune, the luck sometimes, if you will, part of it is luck um, of having really, really good energy in your life about having really good people that you can rely on and lean on. Um, you know, my partners at Ride Maker Films are, are just that. Um, you know, um, Clay Bacord, who's one of my long-term partners, um, you know, he'll be, he's one of the producers on Expectations, the film we just finished, and, you know, I'll tell you about that in a moment, but it, it's been an exciting, I guess you could say, it's kind of an adventure, um, you know, being a part of this company and being there while it was created and being, being a voice in, in sort of a really strong choir of, of, you know, really great individuals, and, I will say that, you know, it's given me the opportunity to learn and work on a lot of different and interesting films, different genres with different creatives over the years, um, all of which have had an indelible effect on my own development as an artist and as a creative, um, you know, and, and, you know, like the late John Mark is a really good example of someone that you, know, you can just silently learn from uh, just by being in the same room, um, you know, same thing with Bradley on Stealing Cars, the filmmaker there. And so I... I, I utilized a lot of the opportunities I've had in my life, um, whether it's through Rainmaker or outside of it, to, to learn because I, you know, kind of like I had hinted at earlier, um, I, I didn't know, you know, this was something that I, I really wanted to do as a younger person. And even when I began the filmmaking process, you know, I've had a very circuitous route to my career. I started off as an executive, you know, I became a producer and, you know, now obviously I'm a, I'm a creative and, and, and it's been a really interesting road map to follow. And I see the positives of it, of being able to be around and being a part of all of these really interesting and intricate projects that have messages, you know, and, and you'll see it very much in expectations too. Um, these messages of family, of identity, uh, gender roles, you know, and you'll see it in almost all of my work. And all of that is a tribute to all of the amazing artists that I was able to collaborate with in my other prospective roles as an executive and a producer um, and, and, and allow sort of the stories and the the wherewithal, the wisdom that they were able to bestow upon me, um, you know, to, to take it in and, and be able to, to, to hopefully bring something that uh, brings some joy to a few people and a few laughs too. Very nice. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about your film, Expectations. You wrote it and you directed it. I know it's based on the literary classic, Great Expectations. So tell us about the film. 
Well, you know, it's funny. We had a little slogan before we began. Um, you know, I, I had some amazing producers on this film. You know, Andrew Panay, Jared Iacino over at Panay Films, and you know, my producing partner Clay Bacorn uh, at Rainmaker and Dave Hansen. And we we had a really entertaining conversation in the early stages of this. Uh, I always a big believer in this idea of having producers who just love the material. They give you great notes. They're never shy of their opinions, and uh, this one is no exception. And so, you know. We kind of had a mission in the beginning to create a great expectation that is not our grandparents' great expectations.、Yeah. So bringing it a little bit different, doing it a little bit differently, and、um, you know, hopefully we're able to to achieve that. But one of the things I will say is that there's an interesting gap in the timeline. You know, we, when we look at when Dickens first created these characters,、uh, you know, it's almost 160 years ago. And there's just so many things that you know when we look at the medical advancements we've had since then, and the technological aspects, and just the, the socio-political development of the world and globalization and a- economics. There, beyond all these changes, there's so many unique things that are similar or, or are the same. And, and sort of, what does that say about our society, especially through a comedic lens? You know, giving a few examples,、um, people love. Inheritance, right? I mean, one of the top shows on television is, big, is Succession, right? So,、yeah. <laughs> I mean, people still think about how important that was in the Victorian era and how enraptured we are today. You know, great expectations. You know, between Pip wanting a benefactor in the source material, it, we get to follow that into the comedic twist that is expectations. Who's inheriting what? You know, as these characters all sort of come together for a weekend, besides this little familial gathering, and they're all orphans. You know the the benefactor is the person who's bestowed money upon them their whole lives. The person that's paid their school fees, or a person that's given them startup capital for their businesses. So there's an element of this that's all about succession. That's an interesting connection between the two.、Yeah. Another thing that's really interesting for me between the two the two time periods is this idea of identity. So much is. About what we were born to be, and you kind of heard me talk a little about my identity and finding along the way. How much of that is still true today? Does it matter who your parents are? Does it matter what you do or the labels beneath your name, like where you went to school or what your resume says? You know, all of these things are really important today as they were then. And likewise, you know, one of the biggest things I think that when we think about the difference between you know this idea of of identity between the Victorian and modern eras. Is the idea of projection? There's so much that we get to put on in this period of time, social media, that is a, a it's a derivative of our lives. Likewise, you know, back in the Victorian era, you can kind of see it in the source material. Pip pretends, you know, he 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 assesses who his benefactor is or the class of person he's come from, and he tries to only show maybe five to ten percent of his personality when he's out in society. How much of that is the same? And how much of that continues, and so expectations is a bit of a dichotomy between the two, but it gives this really interesting topic of how far have we come and how far do we still have yet to go as a people, and so that's that's been part of the fun with the film, and I'd say the other thing with it is that you know out of all the years we we kind of get like one of these adaptations,、uh, an amazing literary adaptation over over the course of maybe eight, eight to ten years, it's a great great expectations、uh, adaptation that comes out and people like. One of the things that's never been done,、uh, as far as I'm aware, is、uh, is creating a companion piece,、uh, a piece that takes some of the characters and situations and continues it from the source material.、Um, and that's one of the things that we did with the film was that this film actually takes place when the characters from the literature in their twenties, and it allows us, because of the growth potential, to see them in a new light. You don't have to read Great Expectations to go along on this journey. You just pretty much need to sit and, ha- and want to watch a dysfunctional family get snowed in. And argue about who's right and who's inheriting what, and、uh, maybe have to deal with the fact that there's a dead body or two, and, and sit around with your popcorn and have a few laughs. And so we're really excited to, sh- to, to bring this this nuance of, the, of these characters and the setting、uh, to, in a new and digestible way to a brand new audience. Yeah, and, and speaking about characters,、uh, it's quite a great cast. I know you have even Rina Lipa, who's Dua Lipa's sister, starring in this. So let's talk about the cast and why you felt they would be perfect for these roles. We,、uh, we we had some time, you know, to to consider, you know, who we wanted and and, and how we wanted to put it together. And I will say that it's a it's a great honor to to collaborate with with all these amazing artists. I mean, it, they they certainly make you look good as a filmmaker when you have really talented individuals <laughs> bringing your characters to life. And I, I say that is that's one of the things that's kind of fun about this job.、Um, I I constantly am on the lookout. Uh, you know, whatever my role is as an executive, a producer, as a creative.、Um, 
to have talent that elevates the material, not, not brings it even to life, but makes it better than how it appears on the page. And so we were really, really fortunate to have amazing actors who could do that. You know, Samuel Arnold, um, you know, who's one of the stars on Emily in Paris, uh, and it's just a terrific actor, uh, brought a brand new energy to the character of Bernard, which is a, a, a original character. You know, there's many characters in this that are original and are not based on the source material, who are entirely contemporary. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a complete joy to work with him. And the same thing with some of our characters, uh, uh, you know, of, of the legendary literature themselves, you know, and Callum McCullough, um, you know, bringing our life, our Pip, and, and, you know, Pip at a different time of his life, or Blue Hunt, who's bringing together a very unique take on Estella in a way that you've never seen her before, um, you know, and I think that that's part of the idea is getting to imbue all of these characters, whether you're familiar with the source material or not, with, you know, a new energy, because let's face it, we're all different, you know, no matter what period of time we were growing up or what time era we were in, people in their teens, you know, or early 20s are going to be very different from their mid 20s or the late 20s. And we're catching these characters at that time frame. And so that gave creative license. Uh, to to our, to our talented performers bringing these characters to life to explore those details beyond the source material, beyond even the script and, and, and really have a say in, in where they were and where they were going. You know, Rena in particular is a really interesting case because she's a, she's a friend and, you know, someone who I, I've been a big fan of her work, um, you know, on the English stage and when she was studying university for some time. And, you know, it, it's always exciting to surround yourself with people who you sort of speak the same language but you know at the end of the day, they're going to do something that you maybe aren't even expecting, that you have a couple takes in there that are, are just, you know, where the performance goes is in a direction that maybe you didn't necessarily anticipate when you created the characters. And, mm -hmm. you know, she is she is no exception. You're, you're going to have a couple nice moments with Rena Leipa in there, and hopefully with the rest of the talented cast as well. That's amazing. I'm actually really interested to watch this movie because I like that you did a modern take on a classic um book so I, I love that and I want to talk about you know I created my platform to inspire to uplift and one of the things that you credit your success to is being a great listener so I thought that was really interesting so let's talk more about that and let's talk about some more traits that you feel have made you successful and why well I I, I really appreciate that Dario, because uh, I don't know you know I like to think I'm a great listener we all <laughs> like to think it until we're in that situation so did you hear what I say so um, so it's interesting because it's it, 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 it is part of that I would say but one of the things that's important to me is, and it's something that I learned growing up um, you know and growing up you know in, in what I would call an unconventional you know circumstance or environment um, you know he said sometimes one of the most important things that ever that 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 ever was done for me, I think, was, was, was listening. You know, and with filmmaking, sometimes we don't have the luxury to slow down. You know, we're fighting a clock sometimes where, you know, there, there's only so many daylight hours if we're on a on location or, you know, we're going to lose a location or a performer, you know, has to return to another project or, you know, we're going to have equipment for specific periods of time. And, you know, all of those things, no matter what size of film you're making, there, there's always going to be pressures. And I think that one of the things that I've enjoyed about this job, um, you know, is being exposed to just really talented people who have been experts in their fields. You know, there, there, there's no actor that's going to come out that's going to be, you know, that I'm going to be able to say, well, I know more about acting. I mean, some of these people have gone to conservatory for, for goodness sakes. Like, there's there's no way that I would be able to do that. What I do know, what I do try to try, try to ex extrapolate is is the character or perhaps the feeling that we're going for that, that, that's, you know, akin to, to telling the apex version of what the story is or what the character needs to reach or globally from 35,000 feet. You know, where is it that the narrative is trying to go to, to lead our audience? And so a lot of times for me, listening is, is a meaningful exchange of that information, of being able to hear, you know, hear why a director of photography really wants to set up a specific shot and then being able to say, well, this is what, you know, we're trying to do or what we want to do. Where can we can we meet in the middle? Where can we, how can we achieve both? And so listening to me comes down to a very simple part of, of the beginning I guess the beginning aspects of communication, and I think we've probably all heard this at this this time frame, where we're all communicating nonstop on socials or on our phones or in person in the in the workplace. 
communication is key to almost everything that is we do. So as a result of it, like I always remember that that's an important part of the component of a meaningful exchange of information. It isn't just communicating what you think or what you feel, but listening to everyone else's as well. And so I, I always endeavor to do the very best I can uh, with that. And of course, by listening and by taking in other information, uh, I, I get to learn a lot more because just listening to myself talk will as charming as hopefully that is, uh, I don't know that I take in anything else than I've already had. So, um, so to me, it, it's it's just essential to any and any period or any job or any any aspect that one finds themselves having to organize or lead. But um, but as always, there's always room for improvement, and there's always ways that we can all do everything better. And I'm 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 certainly an example of that. Um, regardless of such, you know, I think. Many of the traits that, that for me that I've I, I utilized or relied on, you know, to, to be successful or to, to, to reach the, I guess you could say, the, the, the zenith of the, the, the mountain I'm trying to climb for any, any different prospects, whether that's being in my life or just, you know, working from project to project, film to film, you know, some of the traits that I think are really, really important are, are understanding roles. You know, that, that's something that I think ultimately is is really underappreciated but you know everybody it's like playing baseball i hate to come back to that but it's like playing baseball everybody has a position to play and a job to do and they're all really important um but likewise you know you you know you're in toronto you know what happens when you know the pitcher throws the ball sometimes out there rogers they, they've got to have a spread outfield to feel that you've got some great outfielders there so as a result of it the pitcher has to rely on those those individuals to play their positions um, you know, thank goodness Springer's out there when healthy and, and doing his job. Because if that's the case, not much to worry about covering all that ground out there in the outfield. But to that case in point, understanding rules and being able to be respectful of those rules or being able to kind of cut to the chase and, and get to some of the, the conversations that sort of need to be had, I think that those are really important. Um, you know, but I, I think all, all of what I'm trying to say revolves around the simple idea of just understanding why it is that we do what we do what you know for me why do i tell stories why do i want to tell stories you know that is the motivational factor for everything that i do and so always remembering what it is and the basis points of why i do what i do as an artist or as a leader or just as a person working amongst a group of people as long as i have a good and healthy answer to that things have a tendency i think to work out especially when you have to work with other people and so i would credit that uh, you know and, and again going back to my time as an executive in the beginning of my career I, i'd credit that so much to any level of what happiness or um creativity that i have just having learned to try to work with, within a group and knowing when to push and when to step back as well mm, very nice i think that's uh, very useful advice especially for the listening part it's, you know, when we when we just talk, we don't learn anything. But when we listen, that's when we learn. Right. So I, I love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's just like very good advice. But I also want to ask you, when can our viewers expect for expectations to come out? <laughs> well, you know, um, we're kind of in that exciting part of the process right now. We're finishing the film. And so, you know, one of the things that I, I really have enjoyed about this process is the opportunity to be, you know, to work with, with our, our amazing and talented post-production team at Penne Films. Um, you know, Sherry Chung, who's, you know, our, our award-nominated composer, and, you know, where we, we've, we had the opportunity to catch her just fresh off of her final season in Riverdale and Gremlins uh, for Amblin, and so that's really exciting what she's been able to achieve, um, you know, and, and just our really, really great post-production artists who, who have, I would say, have their fingerprints all over this film and ha have been able to make such a difference that it's it, it really is significantly, you know, evolved from the initial vision I had, which for me, again, is always the goal of these journeys. Um, but as we kind of finish that off, you know, we're looking at a 2024 release and, you know, we're in that period of time now as we conclude the uh, the, the editorial process and the post-production process of uh, carefully selecting the festival that we would like to premiere the film in, speaking of TIFF and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of great because uh, at Rainmaker, that's a big push for almost everything that we, you know, we, we, we try to do. We always try to remember the theatrical experience and how important it is, you know, to our viewers. Um, and and, and that, that lives perfectly in line, you know, with 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 streaming films. And I, I believe that both of them this summer is a great example with Barbie and Oppenheimer and, and really everything that's been able to be successful in the box office. 
it shows this great balance that we're achieving between that we can achieve between the cinematic experience and the home view experience and so you know regardless of such that's one of the reasons why at rainmaker we like to take all of our films and give them a festival premiere even if they're going to be um you know on, on on a streamer um and so we're kind of carefully in that process right now of selecting where the home is going to be and where we're going to be able to sort of have the very first viewings and and you know, we'll be really keen and, and sure to let you know as we make those decisions here in the next couple of weeks. Amazing. Well, we hope to see you on the TIFF red carpet in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> Since we talked about it, it's a must. Chris, thank you so much for being on the show today. Congratulations again on all your success. I am very interested in watching this movie and I'm excited for it to come out. So congratulations again. Well, thank you very much for having me, Dario. Really appreciate it and can't wait to share it with you and with all your your viewers and listeners and, and hopefully everybody just has a great time with it. That's that's why I was created. Awesome. Tag TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.